Welcome, friends, to another Q&A session. It's a beautiful day here in Eastern Canada. And um, finally, it's, uh, it's actually quite warm. It's not quite warm, but I can be without a jacket. That makes me smile. And uh, soon we'll have flowers and buds on the trees. So welcome. Um, good to see you guys. Alessandra, good to see you. And uh, of course, if anyone has just started uh, what, are, what we're doing is Q&A sessions. Anything that you want to know about uh, editing, about cameras, lenses, I love talking about it. I love talking about photography. It's something that uh, is really interesting because I'm blessed to have both a hobby and a career merged into one. So please take advantage of that. Also, please tell me what country or city you're from. It's always fun to see who is joining and where in the world. And uh, also it benefits me because already I feel like I need to get on an airplane. Obviously that's not going to happen for quite some time possibly, but I love to hear from where you guys are coming from. And so does everyone else, by the way. Nick Goalkeeper, welcome. And uh, RT Raj from India. I love my Indian friends. Kuwait, welcome. Um, let's see what else we have here. Hello, everybody. Soulful Lens, good to see you. Yusuf, welcome back. Jeremy, good to see you. I live in England, Pleasant Pictures Photography. And by the way, everyone who is um, from India, Suji Captures. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep hearing from where you're from. And by the way, all of the people who are scrolling here, who are part of this, uh, they, all, of, all of you guys have great pictures. Now, I, I don't have time to scan through everyone. Cypress, welcome. Uh, Mark McVicker, good to see you, my friend. Um, however, I don't know if you guys have the ability to um, see uh, all of the people who are on this or, or click on their, uh, on their names. Probably not, because that would take you off this Q&A. But I just want to say that all of you have such great and interesting photos. And I really value going through my Instagram feed because I get to see, if you guys follow me, um, I actually do check out a lot of your, your feeds and I really enjoy going through them. Welcome Costa Rica, Sanjeev, welcome. So put your question marks below in either the comment section or the question mark. By the way, that little question mark icon, I notice is really good for shorter questions. But if you have longer questions, they need to be in the comment section. Now, why is this? I don't know. All I know is that I have a hard time reading longer questions within that little question mark icon. Okay, um, great. So let's get to it. Jeremy on Cloud9. Uh, hi, Mark. Do you use a screensaver on the touch screen on the back of your camera? Jeremy, I should. It's a very good idea, but I don't. So if anyone know, uh, doesn't know about that, they're DSLR or they're mirrorless. There are companies, there are third-party companies, and also possibly Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji do it as well, but it's usually third-party companies that will create a screen protector in the same way that they use it for your iPhone or your Android. And you can get those, and it's really helpful for anyone who is using their camera in environments that could result in a fall, i.e. your camera falls or your camera gets bashed against a tree or a rock. Street photography, adventure photography, landscape photographers, uh, all of those, they, the, um, the cameras are definitely susceptible to uh, either a knock against something hard or a fall. So yes, it's a great idea to have a screen protector and they're not too expensive. I don't do it, but that's only because I haven't got around to it, but it's a great idea. Okay, let's see what else we have here. <laughs> Shahir says, where is the jacket? And uh, what a great question. And I'm very happy to say that I'm, it's plenty warm today. It's the first day, actually, that I've been able to be on my backyard. And as you can see, we don't have any buds yet. But they will come after today. It's a really nice day today. I'm really happy. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, this is a good one. How did you get into photography from Pleasant Picture Photography? That was in 1997. 
And uh, what happened was I was hired by my local university to go to Japan to work as a English as a second language rec recruiter. And while I was there for five weeks, I took some, uh, back then, uh, at least my first effort at taking pictures was great. And I said, I really like this. And I'd like to try to make this my career, especially because a little bit after that, I got into the movie industry, Hollywood movies. And I was working in the movie industry as a, what's called a stills photographer. That would be like every movie has a normal photographer to supplement the advertising images of the actors uh, uh, that goes along with the actual filming. And that would be, in, that was in 1998, if I recall. And so the movie industry uh, got me in there. And then when I, uh, when the movies weren't happening as frequently, I get into advertising photography and then I became a architectural photographer and I still am. Great question. Thank you so much. By the way, if, uh, if anyone is interested, yesterday or two days ago in my Instagram feed there and also I put it on my Facebook, there is a podcast interview by Kelly Lawson and uh, she has a great podcast and it's all about a little bit about my history and how to take better pictures with your iPhone or Android. So if you do have a mobile device and you want to take better pictures of it, take a look at uh, my, my Instagram or Facebook feed and just tap on the podcast. And by the way, you should subscribe to it because Kelly's podcast is excellent. Okay, for those who just joined, welcome. We're doing a Q&A session. And also please type where you're, what country or city you're from because I love to hear. Okay, Mark McVicker. Hey, Mark, late night here. Yes, it would be. You're ex I think you're 12 hours difference, if not 13. Uh, going to hit the hay. I'm going to change phones. Thinking about getting the iPhone 11. Good idea. Mark, it's a brilliant idea. The iPhone 11, I can't stop using it. And I really say that the camera is leaps and bounds beyond the iPhone X. However, I really want to make it clear that I never want people to go into debt to buy the latest and greatest thing. If you have an Android that works well for you, if you have a, a, an older iPhone that works well for you, then keep it, uh, at least until you feel that it's, you're not, it's not serving you. And then you can upgrade. The only reason I'm saying that the iPhone 11 is amazing is because it is. And uh, also, Mark, if you recall, by the way, uh, I was with Mark in Japan a couple months ago. Mark, if you go back to my Instagram feed from when you and I were in Japan, all of those photos were taken with my iPhone 11, and that will show you what's possible. Good, Mark, you, you have to get to bed now. It's too late where you are. <laughs> okay, good to see you all. Okay, um, Mark, I love capturing macro images. Could you suggest a good lens for Canon? I hold the Canon 750D. Yes, so Canon has a couple uh, macro lenses. And uh, I, right off, I don't remember the exact millimeter uh, uh, focal length that they have, but they're excellent. Um, if they have two, uh, both are good. Now, the question is, do you get a wider macro lens or what's called a telephoto? Or I guess you could say a zoomed in view, even though it's not a true, not a zoom. I would suggest if you are trying to figure out what is the better for you, you take the the version or the 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 one that is how would you say it let me back up let's just say that you love portraiture i'm talking about upper body or headshot but you don't have a good portrait lens then you would probably say that i'm going to get a lens uh, a macro lens that i can also use as a portrait lens so then you would choose the 85 probably the 85 millimeter macro or something like that However, maybe you are more interested in architecture or you're interested in landscapes and you get a wider lens that is a macro. Now, why am I saying this? It's because you never want to have a specialized lens that you're only, only going to use two or three times a year. It's a waste of money. That's why you make sure that your lens do, you, they, you can have, a, they can do double duty. You can use them for macro, but you can also use them for regular photography. So you never want to duplicate. You never want a macro lens that is exactly the exact same focal length of a lens that you already have. It's a waste of money. Okay, so I don't know what lenses you have, but I just want to make sure that whatever macro lens you get, it's unique and it's a lens you can actually use daily or almost daily for normal photography as well. 
Now keep in mind everyone that you can actually, if you want to get into macro photography cheap, you can get what's called a close-up filter. They are filters that go on the top or on the front of your lenses. They're really cheap, probably only $10, and that can sort of get you into the world of photography or macro photography for really cheap. Also, there's such things as macro, what would you call them? Um, Oh, the name escapes me. It's a, little, it's a little mini lens that fits between your normal lens and your camera body. Um, the name will come to me in a second. Okay, great question. Let's see what else we have here. Nick, goalkeeper. I'm getting into photography and videography for travel and adventure shooting. Any, any recommendations or ideas for a camera to do both? So if you're doing um, extreme work. Uh, I do tend more toward the professional Canon or Nikon. They're really well weather sealed. They're very tough. However, Fujifilm, the X-T4, is looking really good and the X-Pro3, but I would tend more toward the Fujifilm X-T4. It's, it's tough, it's weather sealed, and it's made for professional work. And uh, the reason why the X-T4 may be a good option rather than the heavier professional weather sealed versions of Canon and Nikon is because that camera is, um, it's, well, feature to feature is cheaper. It's really tough, it's weather sealed, and it's smaller and lighter. So if, the, if you have a big backpack because you're doing adventure photography and a lot of weight, you may be inclined to go with the Fujifilm system because the lenses are just as sharp, but they're much lighter and much smaller. Now, if you are already within the Canon and Nikon system, then all you need to do is make sure that you choose uh, any of the models that are weather sealed and make sure, of course, that your lens is, is weather sealed as well. I use the Nikon D780 for my heavy duty stuff because it's, it's like a brick. It's tough, but I don't use it for travel. I use my Fujifilm system for travel because it is so lightweight and really convenient. Great question. Okay, pleasant pictures. It's very nice here too, isn't that great? It's so nice. In my Nikon DSLR, there are two, 12 uh, focus points. Is there a way to activate all the, the points uh, simultaneously or can we activate only one at a time? Yeah, great question. So focus points are, are programmable and what you would do is if you wanna just go to, um, so you would have a single spot focus that would be um, where you can tell the camera just to focus on that one little spot that you want or you can just have the default where the camera chooses any of the 12 focus points that it thinks is wisest. Now by default your camera does that. It'll take all 12 and it'll look for faces, it'll look for objects that are closest to you and um, that's usually usually like 90% of the time it's going to work well. But However there are times when the multi-focus points is not working well and that would be closer objects or objects that like say for example you're, you're doing a macro shot well the focus points are going to be a disaster in fact all focusing is a disaster for macro that's why you would use manual focus however if you want to get really precise focus especially if you're doing portraiture and if your camera doesn't have eye focus then what you'd go is to is go into your focus section in your camera and choose a single point or single spot focus and then you can actually move that little spot around the 12 focus points to that one that you want and that's what you're hope that's what you should be doing and uh, yeah give that a try okay welcome everybody good to see you poncho s photo magazine welcome hello from india i love my indian friends msm hello kenyan photographer oh that's good the philippines uh, good night, Mark. Good to see you all. Do East, welcome back. And uh, if you've just joined us, we're doing a Q&A session. Ask anything. And if I don't know it, I will make sure that I don't make up a question, <laughs> make up an answer. Okay. Um, love your work, Mark. Oh, I appreciate that so much. What's your advice for getting followers and supporters? So this is a really good question. And I'll tell you that um, it's not easy like I'm at 10k now which I, I like however it hasn't come easy for me and I haven't I haven't bought my, you know I, I have friends who are geniuses at computers and they've they've created Instagram bots to cheat the system and uh, although that's true it's harder and harder to do those these days because Instagram is very intelligent 
Um, I've never done that. I've always just done it legit is giving good content. And, you know, if you look back at my Instagram feed, every single photo almost has a corresponding benefit for the viewer. And I think I have almost 2,000 posts and each post is, I hope, helpful to you guys. And that's the benefit that you're getting. And, uh, and in turn, I get more followers. And, you know, that's, that's all I know how to say is that uh, make sure that, you're, that the world is benefited from your creative skills and it all comes around. Uh, other than that, I, I don't know too much about hashtagging structure. Well, I, I know how it works. Um, I, you can do 30 hashtags and I usually do that, but I must say that I'm not very strategic in that. That's something that I can do better. And otherwise, be encouraging to other people when they post, especially people who are you know, newer to photography, encourage them. And that's a really good way to build that. I think it's called the virtuous cycle. That's the terminology in the social media marketing world where you help other people and they will help you. And that's, just, that's all I know <laughs> with regards to getting more followers and supporters. That's a great question, by the way. Okay, Nick Goldkeeper, thanks so much. Gareth Bland, welcome. Hi, Mark. What camera backpack do you use for travels? Great question, Susie Girl 27 so I use two brands that I encourage you guys to check out. One is called Wotancraft, W-O-T-A-N-C-R-A-F-T. Wotancraft are uh, an Asian company, but they are very, very strongly tied, not in a business sense, but uh, I do see them in Fujifilm camera stores. Uh, Fujifilm users like them a lot because they are really high quality they're artistic and i would say that the hip that hipsters and artistic photographers tend more toward fuji now this is completely ridiculous because you should never choose your gear based on cool people using the gear however it is true that um, because the fuji films are retro and they look so cool that seems to be the case and and hipsters and and uh, fashion-oriented photographers tend toward Wotancraft. And I, if I had mine here, it's up, it's actually uh, <laughs> in my house and I don't have time to go get it, but the Wotancraft bags are really quite stunning and really tough. Now, another option that's American made is, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, Waterfield Designs. And I'll get you, to, if you're American, actually around the world they sell. Waterfield Designs, made in San Francisco, and I think their website is sfbags.com. You could probably check that after. But these are two bags I use. They have leather options for those who love leather. They're amazing. And for those who are vegan-oriented with regards to even um, gear or clothing, they use ballistic nylon, as far as I can tell. Excellent question. I love that. Thank you. Welcome from India, uh, Sal, welcome India, Sal Abdul Halim. Excellent, good to see you all. I'm just going to give you guys some waves. My morning, my morning Jackie, that's a great name. I thought it was my morning jacket, which, uh, okay. Let's scroll here. Sorry, everybody, for the scrolling. Whoa, what happened? Sorry, everybody, I just flipped the button. <laughs> I flipped the selfie camera. What's the best way to start a business? Photo shoots, etc. Pleasant pictures, yes. So you want to be multi-talented. You want to get into all genres. I believe that probably the best way and the quickest way to make money is to do weddings and family portraits. And uh, I could be wrong. I don't know because I don't do those. However, what you want is to make sure that you, you start out in a genre that is recession proof and also it's not at the whim of, of uh, fads. Everyone will continue to get married and families will st still continue to want portraits. Now it's true that family portraiture has taken a hit because of the excellence of iPhones and Androids. However, there will always be um, you know, family members who for legacy want to get a real portrait done. And that's probably the ga a good gateway to get into photography as a business. It's not easy to get into advertising straight away or any, sub, any genres or subgenres. So I'd su suggest you make, you make enough money to buy equipment through weddings and 
family portraiture and normal portraiture. Uh, and if anyone can correct me, because if they're going through, if you got, if any of you guys are starting a business and you find that that uh, it's easy to make money in such and such, then uh, we'd love to hear from you. <clears throat> I love macro photography, but only have a kit lens. Do I need a proper macro lens, says Gareth Bland. I suggest to start out, to get your feet wet, is to get what's called the macro screw-on filter, or it's called a close-up filter. You can get them on Amazon, better yet, your local camera store. And sometimes they come in three packs, so you can get three different magnification ratios, times two, times four, times eight, I think, if I recall. And those are pretty cheap. Try those out first. If you like them, it's a really low-risk investment, and then, you can actually invest in a macro lens. Great question. How to take better pictures in touristy places. Shahir, I have a great thing for you. I have a, a, a homework for you, Shahir. I want you to go through my Instagram feed today or tomorrow, sit on your couch, and I want you to go through um, a year's worth of my Instagram. No, of course, that's, that could, you could do that in two minutes just by scrolling, okay? and. What I do is I go to touristy places and I photograph those touristy places in a very non-touristic way. So the best thing for me to say to you is that learning by visuals is going to help you a lot. And this goes to everybody, not just Shahir. If you want to know how I interpret the tourist places, like I've been to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, I've been to famous landmarks, um, and I... I uh, I, I always want my own spin on it. And you guys will be able to see that by scrolling through a year's worth of my Instagram. Okay, I hope that helps. Um, Andreas, welcome. Do you have a website to compare lenses? Yes. I'm glad you asked this, Shahir. If anyone's interested, DxO Mark is the place to go for comparing lenses. Now, if, if I recall, their website is dxomark.com, but you... You may be able to check that for me and just give me a, a thumbs up on that. Or it may be just dxo.com, I forget. In any case, if, if you can't find that exact URL, just do a web search for dxo, and they are the world leader on comparing lens quality. They also compare lens quality, interestingly enough, for iPhone and Android. So feel free to check that out, and you will be able to uh, really choose with confidence what lens is better within your price range? Excellent question. Pleasant pictures, thanks, I'm happy to help. Okay, welcome Joseph Corey. I'm gonna switch over to our uh, little question mark icon in a second, don't worry. Uh, oh good, Mary says dxomark.com, thank you for that. Uh, single focus, hold half down on button, then, comp then composition or composition, multifocus, then take a picture, on stills, that is. Um, let me read that again. Single focus, hold half down on button, yep, then, comp then composition or composition. Um, Sand411, if you could clarify that question, I'd really appreciate it. I'm happy to answer. I just don't, I don't get it. And do you know why? Maybe it's because I need more coffee. My favorite coffee stores, uh, shops are closed, of course. So I have Circle K coffee. <laughs> it's the only thing I can get uh, that's close by. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, let's pop down to Drash 4 welcome. Uh, by the way, for those of you just joining, Q&A session. Uh, we're going to go to our question mark icons down here. And what I'm going to try to do is choose the one that was oldest. Uh, Jeremy, are you using a UV filter to protect your front lens? Yes, yes, definitely. And here's a little tip for everyone. Those who are concerned about the reduction in quality from a UV filter. Now, technically, yes, there would be the minutest amount of reduction in quality with any new addition of a piece of glass in the front of your lens. That is true. However, in 100%, in uh, what would you say it, uh, maximum viewing on my computer with a UV filter and without, to be honest, I can't see any difference. So if I can't see any difference at 100% with a UV filter and without, then practically speaking, there is no difference. Now, I just want to make sure that if you, uh, I want to clarify that. If you're a professional photographer doing like huge, 
multi-story blow-ups like billboards and so on and you're hired by a big magazine then you would certainly take that UV filter off however if you're traveling if you're doing nature photography landscapes street photography anything where, where you're outdoors keep the UV filter on and the reason I'm saying this is because cameras have a tendency to drop and fall and they will land on a rock or <laughs> or anything that's terrible for a lens and that UV filter has saved me a number of times I have saved a ton thousands of dollars because of a cheap not a cheap but because of a UV filter I've saved thousands of dollars on lenses okay now if you're in studio on a tripod doing food fashion products then yes you can take the UV filter off certainly thank you Jeremy that was a great question uh, okay let's just see here I'm gonna switch between question mark icon and scrolling questions here let's see is Sigma lens 70 to 300 good for portrait photography okay picture base asks the answer is yes to a point um, now your 70 to 300 I believe the lowest f-stop number is what we'd say is an f5.6 and uh, that that's fine there's no problem with that now it's true that it may be a, a little bit soft on the perim perimeter of your pictures but to be honest whenever you're doing portraiture it's very rare that you critically need detail super sharp detail at the perimeter of your lens because the the human face is in the middle usually or if it's not perfectly in the middle it's only slightly offset so I would say that your 70 to 300 is, is great and you would just set it at maybe like if you have a if, a, if you have a, a full frame camera you would set it at um, 105 millimeter or 100 millimeter if you have what's called a, a, a sub full frame meaning an APS-C size camera you can keep it at 70 if you want that would be good and usually what we when we're dealing with portrait photography if we're talking about headshots then something like 100 and 135 millimeter is really good for headshots like an upper body you can get away with a 70 millimeter perfectly fine and yeah I would say go for it don't ever purchase new lenses uh, until you've maximized the technical and the aesthetic uh, would you say uh, capacity of the gear that you already have excellent um, uh, Gilan J who are the photographers you looked up to when you started photography excellent question they were Japanese commercial and advertising photographers and uh, when I went to Japan for the first time all I did was study the posters in Tokyo subway and the Japanese magazines and that's what I got how I got my start and that was in when I lived there I, I first went there in 98 but then I lived there in 99 to 2000 and I really got my my break as it were by studying how they photographed and um, yeah the, so it's a little bit of an abnormal uh, scenario because I don't really have names to put to my influences but definitely those were my influences to begin my career as an advertising and a commercial photographer and um, yeah so that that's uh, and you can it's interesting like if anyone goes to Japan or is visited there one thing you'll notice is that the the imagery the photography is top-notch they are amazing <clears throat> Joseph Corey I have a D 7200 and wanting to upgrade I do nature landscape and some portrait well I notice a big difference in a full frame looking at the D 500 or the D 750 um, so the advantage the advantage of the full frame of course is the greater ability to have background depth of field blur and uh, I have both a full frame and an APS-C so my full frame camera is the Nikon D 780 which I believe could be the the newer younger brother to the D 750 I'm not sure about that but if I need uh, a lot of depth of field like for portraiture I would, I would switch to the Nikon however because if you're a bird photographer or a safari photographer you may be better suited to the smaller APS-C because you can actually get more telephoto range more more of a that zoomed in look however if you are um, do, doing any portraiture I would say that if, if, if and of course if you have the budget then that full frame is going to serve you well because of the greater ability to have what we call a thin depth of field and it's very attractive so yeah 
definitely. If you have the budget, then go for it. Now, I don't know too much about the D500, but the D750 was a great model, still is. So I think you'd be fine with either. And um, just do a comparison online. And there's so many websites that do comparisons between the D500 and the D750. And you'll be able to just decide based on the factors that you want. Usually the newer camera has newer technology, so that's good, but that's also you have to keep in mind price and budget. Okay, I'm just gonna pop over. Okay, one more here. What's your best beginner photography tip? Yeah, it's to soak in as much as possible from photographers that you admire. That's what I did. I looked through magazines, I looked through fashion magazines, travel magazines, all magazines when I first started out, and I learned just through watching. And the nice thing is that it's much easier these days because we have Instagram and you can just go to all the people that you admire, find out what they did, hopefully they'll tell you. Like for example, if you look at my Instagram page or my profile, if I edit my photos, I usually put a before and after because I want you guys to benefit. I want you to learn at least to see how what, what I've done to get those changes. So my last couple, uh, were color edits in Lightroom and you can take a look to see the original shot straight out of the camera and what I did in Lightroom in order to produce a more pleasing look. So, uh, and feel free to, this is not a plug for me, but all of my Instagram photos, probably 95, 95% have lessons attached to them. Also, I do online courses at my website, markhemmings.com. Okay, I'm going to pop over to the question marks because I've, and I think there's quite a few here. Shahir, uh, is there any website to compare lenses? Yes, I'm sorry, I, I already answered this. This is dxomark.com. Okay. Oh, sorry, everybody. I just already answered these questions that I just popped up. Um, let's see what we have here. Do you recommend to be specific in photography? For example, wildlife or street photography? No. This is a very good question, everybody, not just for, for Mary. I don't advise specializing. Get as much skill in all genres that you can. It's critical. Now, the reason I, I say this is because even if you only want photography as a side business or you want to be a professional photographer, if you are specializing, then when that specialty genre goes out of style or is temporarily upset, say, for example, now we have the COVID crisis, I, as a travel photographer and a street photographer, I'm not doing that. However, because I'm multifaceted, I, I know photography genres very well, and within the photography industry, I still have different, different income sources, so it's not an issue. I'm also a video editor, so I can still continue to work. I'm a writer, and uh, so what I'd suggest is get as many different genres as you can and not be specific. The only people who can afford to be specific in one genre are professional photographers in large cities like New York, London, and Tokyo. Otherwise, it's extremely hard to make any money if you just do one genre of photography. Excellent question. I love that. And by the way, if you guys hear a crazy sound in my mic, it's because of uh, someone's, I think, doing something with their lawn or it's a heat pump. Okay, let's see what we have here. How does metering work and how do I adjust it in different scenarios? So what I advise everyone to do is to flip your camera to the default, which is called matrix metering. And matrix metering is intelligent. It's, it knows usually 90% of the time what to do and you don't have to think about it. Now the other types of metering, you would have spot metering where the camera senses only the thing that's in the very center of your picture, which can be useful for rock concerts or theater. However, if you are not a specialist photographer, I would say just stay on the default matrix metering because it has intelligent metering. Okay, it even looks for faces, which is really good. And it will adjust accordingly. So that's my answer to you. However, if you have a further deeper question, because you have a, a genre that you like the best, then please tell me and I'll be happy to answer that for you. Okay. <clears throat> Mike says, how can I make great moon pictures? Yes, this is very good. Now the moon is much brighter than we think. So what you want, first of all, is to get your longest lens 
and uh, then purchase what's called a, a 2x or an x2, a two times teleconverter, and that will extend your lens further. So if you have a 70 to 200 lens, you're going to want to get that 2x teleconverter, which will give you a 140 to 400 millimeter lens, and then take the photo at 400. Use a tripod, and what I advise is that you, you um, use aperture priority, set your lens to f8. Now the reason I suggest f8 is because that's the sweet spot in most lenses, the highest quality. And with regards to the exposure compensation, you're going to go to usually minus, okay, minus one possibly. And the reason why is because we don't want that, that brilliant light to be a blob of light. We want to see texture in the moon. So you're going to adjust exposure using your exposure compensation. Now, what about ISO? Interestingly, what I'll get you to do is an experiment. I want you to take the picture at ISO 100. And because you're on a tripod, you're going to probably find that the picture turned out just fine. If you're not using a tripod, then you're going to want to use auto ISO. And uh, the reason I suggest that is because I haven't photographed a moon in a long time and I'm not sure what a good F8 and auto ISO or uh, ISO amount is going to be. If you're using a tripod, it doesn't matter. You can just use the lowest ISO possible, which is usually 100. Okay? Hope that helped. Okay, let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> 26 minutes ago, sorry about that. I have a Canon PowerShot HS50. Is it ideal for wildlife? Um, what I need to know, uh, Sal Abdul, is what is the focal length? What's the longest to zoom? Okay, so if you're still joining us, uh, even though it was 25 minutes ago, I don't know the Canon PowerShot, what it has for the longest zoom in with regards to millimeters. So if you can get back to me on that, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Alessandra, <clears throat> what's the difference between the macro and micro lens? Yeah, I don't think there's any difference, to be honest. It may just be terminology. Uh, macro is the standard naming uh, convention for looking at close-ups. And if anyone can correct me on that, uh, I'm always happy to hear the difference because in my experience, I've never really known any difference between a micro and a macro. It's possible that a micro lens is a scientific lens that's used by doctors and scientists. If that's the case, then uh, I'd love to know that for sure. I'm just not sure about that, to be honest. Good question. Okay. Uh, Christine, my hi, Mark. Among your works, which one is your favorite? Yes. Well, that's a great question, and with regards to, I, I think I'll uh, start wide <laughs> and narrow down. I, I will say that my favorite place to photograph in the world is Japan, and um, the, my favorite place within Japan, there's three actually, there's Tokyo, Nagano, and Kyoto, and it's probably because I go there every year. And I take photographers such as you or any of you people every February to Japan for a photo workshop. And by the way, if you, if you want to come with me, I do have that planned as long as travel is, uh, there's no travel restrictions this February, this coming February in Japan. And that's found at markhemmings.com. And I have to say that when I look back at my entire collection, the photos that, are, that I, f I find most exciting are from Tokyo. And mainly because I'm a street photographer, that's my primary love right now. And Tokyo, I think, is the world leader for locations for street photography. However, Nagano is brilliant for nature and the famous Japanese snow monkey. So I love being a wildlife photographer for a day each year, uh, photographing the snow monkeys. And then Kyoto has such history. And I love walking the streets of the historic inns and shops. And uh, so it's those three locations and photos within those and by the way, you can, if anyone's interested, my website has a portfolio, a huge portfolio of all the travel that I've done. And that's at markhemmings.com. And I'd love for you to check them out because it's, uh, it's actually fun, I think, to travel, remote, travel uh, virtually while we're indoors. And I actually do that in reverse. I look at other photographers' work of different locations. And by the way, if you're part of... Uh, any of my online courses like digital camera mastery or whatever I do look through the Facebook page of all of your work and I always enjoy uh, seeing the pictures of 
that you guys take from wherever you are in the world because I, I really want to, uh, I feel I need to get on an airplane again. I'm itching to, to head out. Uh, great question. Okay, let's see, the, let's see what else we have here. Where can I learn more on resizing pics for both social media and large prints? Yeah, that's great. So um, what I advise is that, like I do that within Lightroom CC. So if, you, if you're talking about an app for your iPhone, Android, iPad, or tablet, um, Lightroom CC will export uh, the way that you want. It's a custom export or it's small or large or original. And, and unfortunately yesterday I was reminded that you can actually export TIFFs as well and I forgot about that. So yes, I use Adobe Lightroom CC when I'm exporting via my phone. And if I'm doing it from a computer, I use Lightroom CC mobile, or desktop app. However, the other Adobe apps also allow for ex, uh, custom exports and advanced apps. I believe Camera Plus allows for it, and I believe that Pixelmator allows for it. But uh, I haven't used those two apps in, in a long time because I've switched to Adobe apps for my work, such as Lightroom CC Mobile. Oh, and also, for, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but if any of you want to export your images for social media, for example, for upload to Facebook, YouTube, thumbnails, or Instagram, and if you're using Adobe Lightroom CC, they export their small version at 2048 pixels or something like that. And that's perfectly fine. You don't even need to, you don't need to export anything larger than that if the end goal is just to get that image up to, the so, up to social media or your website. So, I hope that's a time saver for you guys. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Oh, good, Sankara Market. Welcome. How do you, nav uh, uh, excellent, uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping to, uh, that all of us St. Johners can uh, get outside soon. By the way, uh, just today, our province's government allowed us to join one other household, one other family member so we can now socialize with one other person. So, uh, Brother Greg, um, it's, uh, it's gonna be a pleasure to uh, come over to your house uh, later today. Uh, how do you navigate taking photos of people from different cultures with their consent, obviously? Excellent question. So, for, first of all, by the way, I could speak hours on this. And uh, one thing is, is that if you are planning to do any commercial work with the photos of other people that you take when you're traveling you need to get a model release signed and uh, if you don't have a model release you cannot use their images to advertise a product or a service now there's a, def a different scenario if you are shooting edi editorial and editorial is for newspapers it's for news outlets uh, then you don't need a model release and you can publish those images of other people if they're newsworthy and this is um, common practice, for example, news photographers or photojournalists, when they're creating image, uh, images or content for news, they do not need to get model releases uh, at all. Um, now, with regards to me, uh, if you look through my Instagram feed, you're gonna see thousands of street photos of people, and I don't sell them. They're just for pleasure, it's my art and I make my money as a photographer through commercial and advertising photography and I make my money through doing hosting international workshops uh, through teaching through online courses at my website markhemmings.com but I don't I don't sell uh, any of my street photography as products or services so that's why I'm able to um, continue to photograph internationally um, photograph people without asking per permission. Now keep this in mind is that I never show people in a ridiculous light or I never bel belittle them. Uh, my rule of thumb is that they, the picture needs to be neutral in tone or make them look great or positive in tone and that's just my own personal ethic and that's how I view street and travel photography. St. Cara Market, thank you for that. Good question. Okay, sorry, one second. And I'm just gonna scroll because I see a couple things that came up in my scroll and I hope I didn't uh, forget anybody. One second. And if you just joined everybody, then 
I'll give you guys a little wave here. Please feel free to ask any questions and also uh, let me know what country you're from. Okay, picture base. Thanks, I have another question. Do you edit your photos using a phone? Yes. So what I do is I see the Adobe Lightroom CC mobile and desktop workflow as uh, fluid. And 50% uh, of the time I'm editing using Lightroom CC on my phone, my iPhone 11 Pro Max. And the other 50% of the time I'm doing it on my MacBook Pro. And the reason that I'm confident in that because I've analyzed <coughs> both screens on my iPad, sorry, my iPhone and my MacBook Pro and the screen color is almost identical. So I get the same results, which is really good. And the nice thing is because I'm on the move a lot, or I was, is that uh, I can edit my photos while in the car, while on a bus, while on a train, a plane, wherever. And it's really, or a cafe, and it's really great. So yes, I do edit on my phone using, a, using the mobile version of a Lightroom CC. Okay, let's see what else we have. Jimmy Jim sent a request to be live in your video. And uh, yes, let's get to that. If that was, if you didn't, if you pressed it by mistake, just ignore it, but we'll get back to you on that. Uh, have an A6000 with a 35 millimeter 1.8 and a 70 to 200 and kit lens. I have a new grand baby. Oh, congratulations. I'm pretty, I'm pretty new shooter. Which lens is best? Yeah, 35. You want that 35 1.8. And the reason being is that the 70 to 200 has what has what we call a, um, it's not as, fast a lens. Now the word fast is uh, a technical photographer's jargon, uh, but your 35 millimeter f1.8 is a gem. It's an absolute gem. So definitely use that because children, grandchildren, kids, when they're running around, you want that f1.8, that wide open aperture to let as much light, in, light into your camera to get a good shot. So yes, definitely you want 35, 1.8, and you'll be all set. Joseph, uh, thanks Mark for the info and the reply to my picture. I'm happy to do so, happy to do so. Okay, Alessandra, what's the difference between a macro and a micro lens? Okay, yes, sorry, I, I think I'm scrolling wrong here. Okay, Mike says, thanks, I'm gonna do this. Gareth Bland, wondered that myself. I bought a micro lens, 60 millimeter, when I was a dentist. Oh, there we go. I was right. Yeah, so micro has to do with the, uh, the medical and the scientific industry. Well, Al Alessandra, you just answered my own, you answered my question, so I thank you for that. Karen Smith, welcome. Okay, Karina, welcome. Let me know what country you guys are from, too. Uh, St. Cara Market, I'm happy to help out. UK, yes, Gareth. Iran, thank you. Any tips for architectural photography? Yes, I am a professional architectural photographer and I absolutely love it. What you're wanting usually is nothing wider than a 24. A 24 millimeter, when I say that, I'm referring to the, the full frame uh, 24 millimeter. And the reason being is that anything wider than a 24 for interiors really distorts the perspective. Now, when I'm talking about perspective, I'm talking about the viewer's ability to judge scale or size of the interior space. And especially if you are a real estate agent, going beyond 24, or sorry, wider than 24, gets into the, it's the range of being, of, of being untruthful. So 35 is better for truthful when you're talking about interior architecture. However, 35 is just sort of on the edge. It's maybe a little bit difficult to get as much of that room in the shot as possible. So the 28 millimeter full frame, when I'm talking, I'm saying full frame uh, of uh, focal length, 28 is a good middle ground. So I would say a 24, 28 millimeter or 35 is the three focal lengths that you should be looking at with regards to architecture. Now, next, I advise prime lenses. Now, why would I want a prime lens? Now, by the way, if you don't know what a prime lens is, it's a non-zooming lens. But for architecture, prime lenses are really good because they usually, not always, but usually have a better control on what's called um, a barrel distortion. Now, barrel distortion means that a straight, a straight box would look not circle-ish, but uh, it, would have, it wouldn't have straight lines, okay? 
So that barrel distortion is reduced when you have a good quality prime lens. If you're a Canon shooter, one of the best lenses I've ever used for architecture, now it's expensive, but it was a 24 millimeter F 1.4 L series lens. However, you don't need that. That's like a $2,000 lens. You can get easily, just get a 24, a 28, or a 35 prime lens, and it can be f2.8, it can be, it doesn't matter what f-stop it is, because you're going to be shooting at f8 or f11. Now, you say, well, Mark, why would you want f8 or 11 if you could go all the way up to f22 or f32, possibly? Because in architecture, you want a lot of the scene. Well, my answer is, is that overall, the best quality f-stop, or we'd say aperture, is usually either f8 or f f11. When you're doing architectural interior photographers, uh, interior photography, what you're wanting is, is technical sharpness both in the center of the, of the uh, lens and the perimeter. Now cheaper lenses and zoom lenses have a hard time with perfect sharpness on the perimeter of the image. That's why I advise a prime lens anywhere from 24, 28, or 35 Always use a tripod and get as straight on and as sharp as straight on as possible. Also, don't photograph always from eye height. Photograph a little bit lower, which will expand the impressiveness of the building. Now I went I went long on this, Karina. I have a little homework for you and also for all of you. What I'll get you to do is after we hang up in a couple minutes, I want you guys to go to my website, markhemmings.com then go to my, my portfolio, my photo collection, and scroll down to see architectural photos. This is my collection of all of my favorite architectural images, both exterior and interior, and that will help you understand how I see a room or how I see an exterior. If, you, if any of you are involved in uh, real estate photography, I would advise you to do that as well. So you go to markhammings.com, go to my portfolio or my image collection, and tap on the architectural portfolio. Okay, hope that helps. Okay, Stephen from the US. If you had five minutes to pack a photo, a photo bag to go on a trip, what would you pack? Yes, so uh, my go-to is my Fujifilm uh, collection and really, I limit myself to one lens when I'm doing travel trips, and that's usually a 35 millimeter. Uh, so I would have one camera body, that would be a, any any one of my Fujis, plus the 35 millimeter f/2. Now, the re, for any Fuji users, the the f/2 series that Fuji makes are really good. They're weather resistant. They're small, light, inobtrusive, super sharp, and they are in. Re, I could be wrong about this, but I believe that they are in the ranges of um, 23 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, and I think they might have a, a 75, I'm not sure. Anyway, the F2 WR series. So I'd have that one lens, the 35, I'd have my one of my Fujifilm bodies, and an extra battery, and that's it. That's all I would take. And I've done that. And if you look back, actually, if you look back at my um, two months ago when I was in Mexico and three months ago when I was in Japan in my Instagram feed, all I ever do is just use, usually just use one lens. I'm sorry, that was with my iPhone. But previously, I just take one, one prime lens and one camera body on my trips and I'm all set. It's very risky to do that, by the way. I don't advise it. <laughs> um, okay, I'm struggling with carry with carrying my tripod while walking around the city. Yes, Shahir. Um, and usually, you know, if, unless you're doing time lapses of, um, of uh, headlights and taillights at night, I, I don't even bother with my tripod these days, to be honest. So if, I, if I'm in an, a really dark environment, like for example, in Tokyo, they have these great yakitori alleys that are dimly lit with these beautiful Japanese paper lanterns. It's really dark. I don't even bother with a tripod. I just jack my ISO, ISO up. Now, for those who are nervous about increasing your ISO, I, I said a quote yesterday, and I, I really stand by it because I've been doing it for years. I'd sooner get a, a, good, a good photo that has a lot of noise than to miss the photo altogether because of uh, the mistake of a slow shutter speed. 
So I always advise you to never be afraid of increasing your ISO to get the shutter speed that you need to get the shot, okay? So, and the, the lucky, the nice thing is, is that these days, newer cameras have incredible ability to have low, low noise when you're at high ISO, plus you can actually have a setting within your DSLR or mirrorless that reduces the noise at higher, uh, higher noise level, uh, higher ISO levels. So take a look to see if you have something called high ISO NR, and that means high ISO noise reduction. And if you tap this to on, your camera processor is going to take that photo and then remove to the extent that it can or uh, diminish the appearance of noise. And if that fails, you can even do it further within Lightroom. It's really convenient. So that's my advice. Jack up that ISO when you need it. Okay, so we have uh, a couple minutes left. Oh, Linda, good to see you. Welcome. <clears throat> and uh, before I have to say goodbye, because we, this gets capped at 60 minutes from Instagram, I do want to say that I'm uploading these to my YouTube page, which is Mark Hemmings Photography School. So look for that. And uh, I'll probably be able to update every day, uh, upload these every day, except Sunday. And by the way, tomorrow I am taking a day off. And uh, what I'll be doing is each weekday and Saturday be doing these for you all, at the same time, until New Brunswick, my province, uh, allows us to, to or re removes the restriction. Okay? And I don't know when that is, to be honest. Okay, let's see what else we have. Hello, Mark. Hopefully I am included. Yes. So, Linda, um, I see that you requested to be live. If you press this by mistake, then just decline. And that's, uh, let's see here, add. Okay. Let's see if this works. Um, a lot, by the way, that little two smiley faces means you can come on live and ask your question. And... Uh, if you do press that by mistake, just decline it. And Jimmy Jim, let's see if this, if you want to come live on me, on uh, this, uh, this Instagram uh, live feed. And if not, just press decline, okay? Because sometimes people press it by mistake. Okay, have a Canon, use Canon 200D. And how was the experience with the Sigma 70 to 300, it says picture based. Okay, I, sorry, have used the Canon 200D, and how was the experience with the Sigma 70 to 300? Picture based, can you rephrase that just so I know what it, if it's a question or a statement? I'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, Shahir, thank you so much for your time. Yes, I am so happy to help out. And uh, one second here. Well, this is extremely convenient. Um, this is the first time that we answered all the questions right before I have one minute left before Instagram shuts me off. And I'm getting a whole bunch of texts here from family members too, so it means I have to get going. So, uh, <laughs> so everybody, have a great day. Thanks for joining me. And I'm not going to be going online tomorrow, but Monday I will. So check back Monday. And I hope you all have a fantastic day. God bless and uh, enjoy the weekend.